So good morning, everybody, to those of you who are in the Americas, um, but good afternoon and good evening to those who are joining us from other parts of the world. Um, my name is Manjiri Mahajan. I'm Associate Professor for International Affairs and Co-Director of the India-China Institute at the New School in New York. Um, on behalf of the India-China Institute and our partners, it's my great pleasure today to welcome you to what is our first event of the academic year. Um, this year, we have organized a series of panels that seek to examine the erosion of an older international order that has long been characterized by the dominance of the US-European axis. Um, so through our conversations this semester and next semester, we hope to look at new arrangements, political, economic, technological, uh, that are challenging and replacing older institutions of globalization, older institutions of multilateralism, and putatively liberal norms of internationalism. We'll be covering a range of topics in our panels, including food security, global governance organizations, infrastructure and technology wars. Um, but our first panel today is on the changes in the nature of domestic political regimes and the implications this has for driving the transformation of the world order. So the India-China Institute has been very glad to co-organize this panel with the Center for Asian Studies in Africa at the University of Pretoria. Um, at this point, it's going to be my pleasure to turn it over to Alf Nelson, who's the director of that center and professor of sociology at the University of Pretoria. Um, Alf will introduce and moderate this panel, um, but just a word of warning that where he is based right now in South Africa, um, they are experiencing rolling power blackouts. And so there is instability both in his internet connection and in his power connection. So he's going to have to keep his video off so that his voice is clear. Um, hopefully it will, Alf will be able to um, be heard seamlessly. But Alf, I'm going to hand it over to you at this point. Thank you very much, Manjuri, and welcome to everyone who's joined us uh, for the webinar. To give a little bit more uh, detail uh, to uh, what we're about to embark upon, uh, what we are going to look at today uh, is the uh, complexities that emerge in a changing world order where uh, we also witnessed deepening trajectories of autocratization uh, across states in uh, the global south. In India, for example, Narendra Modi and the increasingly authoritarian right-wing Hindu nationalist BJP government uh, preside over an unprecedented trajectory of attack on democratic institutions and freedoms. Moreover, under Xi Jinping, China's intensification of authoritarianism in its uh, one-party state has been concomitant with the rollout of ambitious challenges to the liberal global order through initiatives on global development and global security. And here in South Africa, where I'm speaking to you from, uh, sadly without my uh, video on, uh, the erosion of the ANC's post-apartheid hegemony has opened up space for the crystallization of a new right-wing populism grounded in xenophobic conceptions of nationhood and belonging. So what we're going to do in this panel is to try and interrogate the significance and implications of the entangled unfolding of illiberal politics uh, at the domestic scale and the transformation of world order so that we might be better able to understand the nature of our current uh, turbulent conjunction. We have three speakers with us, all eminent, all excellent. Uh, our first speaker is Suhas Parshikar, who is based at uh, Pune in India and who taught political science from 1978 to 2016. He is co-director of LOKNITI, uh, a research program on comparative democracy based at, at CSDS in Delhi. And he's the chief editor of the biannual uh, journal brought out by SAGE called Studies in Indian Politics. He has been associated with India's national election study since uh, the 1996 general elections and was one of the principal investigators of the International Project on Democracy in South Asia. He writes in both English and Marathi, uh, his mother tongue on contemporary Indian politics, and has also written extensively in academic publications on the theme of democratic politics in India. 
His latest books include The Last Fortress of Congress Dominance, which was co-authored with Rajeshwari Deshpande and published in 2021 by Sage, and Politics and Society Between Elections, edited with Siddharth Swaminathan and also published in 2021 by Routledge. Some of his other works include Indian Democracy, published by OUP in rural absolutely excellent and crucial edited volumes on electoral politics in India and party competition in Indian states. Our second speaker of the day is uh, Kelly Tseng Tsai, who is the Dean of Humanities and Social Science at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Prior to joining uh, the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, she was Vice Dean for Humanities and Social Sciences from 2010 to 2013. Director of the East Asian Studies Program from 2008 to 2010, and uh, also a professor of political science at Johns Hopkins University. Her non academic experience includes working at Morgan Stanley and consulting for the World Bank and various government subcontractors. She is regarded as an authority on informal finance in China and the impact of adaptive informal institutions on endogenous institutional change. Her current research concerns party state capitalism in China, the surveillance industry, and the political economy of remittances and ethnic foreign uh, direct investment in China and India. Uh, Kelly has published extremely widely, and I'll limit myself here to mentioning some of her many, many books. In 2023, she published The State and Capitalism in China, co-authored with Margaret Pearson and Meg Rithmeyer with Cambridge University Press. This book was preceded in 2007 with, by Capitalism Without Democracy, the private sector in contemporary China, which was published by Cornell University Press. And before that, in 2002, Back Alley Banking, Private Entrepreneurs in China, also with Cornell University Press. Our third speaker this afternoon is William Shockey. Will is the editor of Africa is a Country which is a major site and platform of opinion, analysis, and new writing on and from the African left. And if you don't know it, you should most definitely check it out. In addition to pursuing a PhD in philosophy at Witch University in Johannesburg, Will is a prolific public intellectual who for the past several years have written extensively and also produced a number of podcasts with clear-eyed, wonderful analysis on critical issues across multiple fields from South African politics to international affairs. Welcome to all three of our speakers. Little bit of housekeeping. Each of our speakers will talk for approximately 10 minutes and their interventions will be followed by Q&A. The audience can put their questions in the Q&A box and I'll moderate the exchange. So Hans, the floor is yours. Please take us away. Thank you, Hans. Um, a word of thanks to uh, the co-organizers, the India-China Institute at the New School and uh, the Center for Asian Studies in Africa uh, at the University of Pretoria, but particularly to Manjiri, Mark, Alf, and of course, not to forget Grace, who uh, made it possible to coordinate this entire event. Um, it's a pleasure uh, to talk about uh, regime changes in this panel, but at the same time, it's, there is a sense of melancholy in it. As Arf pointed out in his initial comments, the changes that are happening in the regimes of various countries of the world are not exactly very welcome from the viewpoint of what one may call as the broader structures of democracy and public well-being. Uh, I would restrict my comments, however, only to the contemporary movement in India so that we can save on time. And while I would be very uh, telegraphic in some of the comments, I would most welcome uh, your questions so that I can elaborate on uh, some of those things. Well, to begin with, the post-independence regime in India, uh, in a sense, created a liberal democratic framework with an ideology of socio-economic transformation. And a tension was built, obviously, between these two, while the former, the liberal democratic framework, prioritized wisdom of the individual and the civil society. The latter, the ambition of socioeconomic transformation, emphasized wisdom of the state. Besides this tension, between 1950 and 1980s, there were a number of deviations and challenges 
in the conduct of this regime, in the performance of this regime. Uh, I will not go into those because that's not the topic at the moment, but they were either defeated or marginalized, and in most cases, democratically negotiated. Uh, that takes us to the question of where actually did the rupture begin? Because while we might seem uh, to appear that certain events are dramatic, regimes don't change overnight necessarily. And therefore, I would locate the rupture in the conduct of the earlier regime and the beginning or early beginning of changes in the late 80s and the early 90s themselves. Uh, it is this period in India when the question of majority-minority relationship came to the center stage with an offensive mounted by a populist movement. This movement also privileged religious identity as the basis of nationhood. Along with this, coupled with this in the 1990s, there was a new liberal turn to the economic policies of the country, which provided a fodder to two questions. One question was the relationship between the state and the question of inequality, whether the state should intervene in questions of inequality. That was one. And the other was how to regulate private capital, which has always been a question in all liberal democratic regimes in a sense, but since 1990s, it became critical. The other contextual factor that brings us to the current regime or current changes in the regime is the period between roughly between 2012 to 2014, which opened up a number of possibilities. During this period, because of the new aspirations of the middle class, combined with the frustrations of the lower classes, a peculiar social atmosphere constituted itself. The media was the major actor in the development of these possibilities for the emergence of a different regime. And one of the curious questions, which we might try to answer later in the Q&A, the corporates have been the supporters of this transformation from the old regime to the new regime. The point, therefore, is that the current regime which is emerging or has almost emerged has not happened through any coup, not through any conspiracy, but a very long ideological movement which itself was clearly aimed at regime change and an electoral victory in 2014 which was not explicitly giving any mandate for regime change. The first term of the present government between 2014 and 2019, in a sense, was sedate. It was trying to build various blocks of regime change in the future. And rapid changes started happening after 2019. I would just list five or six important elements of this new regime so that we have some basis for discussion subsequently. The first is an emphasis on being global power uh, instead of a regional power. Uh, while this is more a domestic rhetoric, this has also implications for global context and uh, international relations. The second is the contradiction of an assertive middle classes and an unfulfilled expectation of the lower strata. So while India is talking of expanding the economy, this contradiction continues to haunt us. The third is the rise, probably the rise and rise, because it was not absent earlier either, the rise of crony capitalism as it is alleged. Of course, these allegations continue to be deeply politically debated in India today. But the implications for new liberal project of crony capitalism is something that we should be keeping in mind and maybe discussing. On the socio-cultural platform, there has been a rise of what when can be broadly described as religious majoritarianism. Uh, I have tracked it for some time and between 9, 2004 and today, the approval for religious majoritarianism has moved from roughly one third to roughly one half of the Indian electorate. So there has been a consistent rise in majoritarianism. Uh, all new regimes require in the political arena deinstitutionalization. And that has been happening in one way or the other. 
autonomous institutions not functioning autonomously or autonomous institutions not being allowed to function autonomously control institutions and accountability institutions not functioning effectively like the parliament and so on so in a number of ways deinstitutionalization has been taking place and finally the emergence of a strong and hard state authority which is characterized by centralization authoritarianism or a grain of authoritarianism again this description would be politically controversial and emphasis on surveillance and again all these elements at least centralization and surveillance seem to have considerable public approval in the indian context today therefore i would argue that the regime change project has been almost halfway through it is still not clear whether the regime has established and entrenched itself so much that it is difficult to now change it immediately or not but it is definitely halfway through in the current global context it is unlikely to be deterred or discouraged by international pressures internal challenges have been more or less domesticated dissent has been discredited there has been continued media support for the regime the bureaucracy has generally capitulated and most importantly as far as public support is concerned the welfare as an idea of right has been replaced by welfare as patronage as a result of which large sections of the populace are now obliged or patronized by the regime so the question is which i have been asking since 2017 in fact is a new hegemony shaping in india is it only a new political authority emerging and forcing itself on the public or a new hegemony is emerging there has been an ideological vacuum among the opposition there has been a gradual rise of new intellectual environment and changing normative basis of existing governance structures in a sense let me conclude therefore so that we have enough time later india is at the crossroads all the paraphernalia of the new regime is already there but the hegemony of the new regime is still predicated on a very liberal use of coercion dominance is dependent on electoral ascendance in a sense what i foresee therefore is that in the coming decade or so there would be an epic tension between the lived diversity of india and a manufactured imagination of uniformity so the economy and the economic crisis would be at the backdrop and this socio cultural tension would play out in the public arena thank you very much thank you very much shahas for your insights and for your incisiveness we're going to hand over to kelly for uh, the next intervention kelly the floor is yours Thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? Great. I really wish I could just continue listening to Professor Pelshikar's insights. <laughs> really um I I yeah, I look forward to continuing the conversation. Um but thank I would like to thank uh the India China Institute and the Center for Asian Studies in Africa for co-hosting this event and I'm very much looking forward to engaging with the fellow panelists and the audience. What I'm going to be talking about today is based on collaborative work that I've been doing with Margaret Pearson and Meg Brithmeyer on the concept of party state capitalism in China with a focus on a piece that we published in International Security. And what inspired this particular strand of our research is the long-standing belief that economic interdependence through trade and investment will promote cooperation among states and reduce the likelihood of national security conflict. In a strand of international political economy called liberal institutionalism, interdependence is expected to pacify conflict or produce cooperation between states even among potentially rising powers and these expectations were generally borne out during the first three decades of china's reform era which started in the late 1970s um in, influential voices made the case that china's accession to the world trade organization would have a liberalizing influence on domestic politics and that economic engagement with china would lead to the diffusion of liberal international economic norms and practices but 
In recent years, there's been a very sharp backlash from OECD countries against economic engagement with China, including calls for decoupling from Chinese firms in key supply chains. And what we see here is a security dilemma logic. Security competition with China in the economic realm requires expanding the conventional concept of security to include contestation over firms and the consequences of economic interdependence. And this has implications for the so-called post-Cold War liberal international order. So we think it's really important to understand the causal mechanisms underlying the shift to the securitization of the international political economy. And our main argument is that the security dilemma dynamics that we see today in the form of securitized economic competition can be traced back to the Chinese Communist Party's perceived threats to regime security. And I'm gonna outline, the, they're both internal ones and external ones. In terms of perceived domestic threats, the trend was already quite clear by the mid 2010s. And what happened in 2019 in Hong Kong and the outbreak of COVID in 2020 just deepened the sense of domestic turmoil. Meanwhile, there were also a host of perceived external threats. And you had the cover, color revolutions, the global financial crisis, Arab Spring, um, Edward Snowden's revelations that the NSA had hacked into Huawei was a real wake up call. And so taken together, this resulted in a profound sense of insecurity and the perceived urgency of risk management responses. So in 2014, China established a new national security commission followed by the introduction of the concept of comprehensive national security, which specifies 16 different types of security, including traditional security, such as political security, territorial security, and military security, but it also includes new areas, such as ecological security, cultural security, biosecurity, and of direct relevance here, economic security. And this integration of security priorities with development is manifested in what we call party state capitalism. I'll talk about each of these developments in turn briefly to show how they, they really do mark a sharp departure from China's earlier pattern of state capitalism. First, and I don't expect you to read all of this, <laughs> there's, there's been a slew of new legislation that effectively securitizes firms and other economic actors. And by securitize, we mean that these laws explicitly ascribe national security roles to Chinese firms. For example, the 2015 national security law obligates enterprises to uphold national security and cooperate with national security efforts. The 2016 cybersecurity law requires network providers to provide technical support and assistance to state organs related to national security. The 2021 data security law expects enterprises and individuals to protect data security and prohibits them from providing critical data to foreign countries. Meanwhile, the Communist Party, when I say party, it's the Communist Party, has stepped up the establishment of party branches and firms. Uh, State-owned enterprises and large private firms have long had party branches, but over the past decade, the reach has expanded to over two thirds of all non-state firms. And this includes China-based offices of multinationals. Under party state capitalism, we've also seen the expansion of state capital well beyond firms that are majority owned by the state in a process that's been described as financialization of the state. There are now state-owned capital investment companies that invest in non-state firms to advance industrial policy goals. Party state entities have also been purchasing 1% stakes called special management shares in tech firms and media firms that give them one seat on the board of directors with veto power over ideological content. The party state has also established over 1,800 industrial guidance funds for investing in priority industries. So tens of thousands of semiconductor companies have been established in just the last few years, but there's been a lot of corruption, misuse of funds, and waste. So it remains to be seen how effective these funds will actually be. The third development under party state capitalism is the blurring in the bound, a blurring of, in the boundaries between the state and private actors. The party has actively promoted mixed ownership since 2013 and reiterated that goal in 2020. 
And one of the motives in allowing private capital to acquire minority stakes in state-owned enterprises is the hope that partial privatization could make state capital more efficient. Mixed ownership also allows state-owned enterprises and state funds to take ownership shares in private enterprises through venture capital and state-owned capital investment companies. An additional manifestation of the blurring of the traditional public-private distinction is that private firms in China have assumed state functions to achieve other policy goals. Large tech companies have embraced the Xi administration's poverty alleviation efforts in ways that far, you know, totally surpass the expectations of standard corporate social responsibility, responsibility programs. And in this sense, we view we observe a merging between the party state and private enterprises in achieving public goals. Alibaba, for instance, has deployed its Taobao e-commerce platform to develop rural products, product markets, and also connect villages by funding road construction in rural areas. I mean, this is an e-commerce company building roads. Country Garden, one of uh, China's largest real estate developers has supported modernization of agricultural cooperatives. The e-commerce giant Taobao has introduced their own contract enforcement and dispute resolution procedures to support online transactions. Private firms have also become key actors in supporting the state's domestic security objectives. The private tech sector overwhelmingly dominates the supply of hardware, technology, and information that comprise China's expansive surveillance apparatus. It's not SOEs, it's, it's private tech firms. And finally, there was a significant tightening in the political and regulatory environment for tech firms in 2020 and 2021 in particular. The, the stated reason for the tech crackdown was risk management and antitrust reasons, data security, and what they called disorderly expansion and barbaric growth of capital. But other sectors were also targeted, such as online gaming, private tutoring, and celebrity influencers. These crackdowns taken together were framed through the ideology of common prosperity. Meanwhile, individual entrepreneurs have also been subject to disciplinary treatment or gone very quiet in other sectors, including real estate and large conglomerates. This isn't a, a comprehensive list of Chinese tycoons who have been detained, arrested, or, or gone silent on social media. And the official reasons for these detentions include corruption, uh, running mafia style gangs, picking quarrels, and illegal fundraising, but there are also political reasons as well. The expectation of political correctness under party state capitalism extends to multinationals operating in China. Some firms have been really proactive in demonstrating political compliance by establishing party cells in their China offices, but especially after 2018, a growing number of major foreign brands and organizations have been pressured to express contrition for various political faux pas, mainly relating to how Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Tibet are portrayed in their advertisements, websites, or social media. And it's just clear that many businesses with significant stakes in the China market have changed their discourse and behavior, whether due to direct pressure or self-censorship. For example, when the general manager of a US MBA team tweeted support for Hong Kong's protesters in 2019, China's state-owned central TV suspended its MBA protests. And there are many other examples. All of these manifestations of party state capitalism, including securitization of China's economy and blurred boundaries between the state and private firms is being perceived abroad as evidence of China's state changed intentions and also China's willingness to use firms to enhance its capabilities. So policymakers in Western countries are treating all Chinese firms as the same, regardless of their ownership type. And you see here some quotations from Senator Corrin in the US and the Australian um, FIRB to, to that effect. The net effect of all of these developments is growing economic backlash against China and Chinese firms. In the classic security dilemma in international relations, the security dilemma refers to how state efforts to make themselves feel more secure have the unintended effect of making other states feel less secure, which can lead to a downward spiral of an arms race and heighten the risk of military conflict. In the context of China, we observe that efforts to stabilize its domestic political economy, as seen in the transition to party state capitalism, has similarly had the unintended effect of making other countries feel less secure and suspicious of its intentions. 
economic interdependence with China has clearly become a national security concern in many OECD countries. There's heightened scrutiny of Chinese investments. Large Chinese firms are, extend, are assumed to be extensions of the party state, regardless of whether they're private or state owned. And there are various new initiatives to manage the China threat. So what does this mean for Chinese firms? Uh, to be sure, there's pressure to decouple from China, especially among OECD countries, but despite the EU's toolbox for 5G security, for example, Chinese vendors still supply over 50% of 5G equipment in Europe, including Germany, Italy, Poland, Portugal, Austria, and Spain. Also, the actual impact of various import bans and export controls has been modest on China's tech companies. China's surveillance firms have expanded into non-OECD markets through its uh, BRI and the digital Silk Road. Hick Vision and Dapa supply nearly 40% of the world's surveillance cameras and their sur surveillance technology is being used in over 80 countries, um, many of whom are, are not democratic. And well, over 70% of Huawei safe city contracts are in illiberal countries. There's not only robust market demand for Chinese tech products beyond the OECD, many governments in the global South continue to welcome Chinese investment, Brazil, Rwanda, the Philippines, and so forth. I'll just end my remarks by saying that China's shift to party state capitalism and the backlash that it's engendered is by no means a global phenomenon. I also think, perhaps optimistically, that despite contemporary geopolitical tensions, economic interdependence still has potential for serving as the basis for cooperation with China among countries that seek to ex avoid exclusive alignment with the West. Thank you. And I look forward to chatting more after I stop sharing this. All right, thank you very much, Kelly. That was uh, wonderfully insightful. Uh, we're moving on to our third speaker. Uh, Will, uh, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Alf, and thanks very much to the India-China Institute at the New School in the Center for Asian Studies in Africa at the University of Pretoria. I should begin my remarks by also putting out a disclaimer that I'm based in Johannesburg as well. So at any moment, my power is at threat of disappearing. And it's funny, we've now reached a point in our national crisis of rolling blackouts where the blackouts are unplanned and unpredictable. Uh, our Minister for Mineral Resources and Energy, this very haughty man called Gwede Mentashe, in a show of so South African exceptionalism, used to joke that in, Af in South Africa, at least, we warn you when the power's going out, we're different to other countries in the global south, that that's not the case anymore. Um, and I think that's that's very telling of, of where the country is at the moment. So I'm going to try and breeze through what I have to say today. Um, and thanks to Sulhas and, and Kelly, there, there are a lot of echoes with, with South Africa and also a lot of discontinuities. And I think the South African case can be summarized as being an interregnal one. It's the classic Gramscian situation of the old dying and the new struggling to be born. And so the way I'm going to divide my remarks today is I'm going to first give a very brief political context of South African democracy and political economy since 1994, the end of apartheid. And then I'm going to discuss the social structure of populism in South Africa and where the country might head in the next period. So as we all know, South Africa heralded democracy in 1994. It entered a non-racial constitutional democracy, the African National Congress, the party of Nelson Mandela, established itself as the leading anti-apartheid movement and instituted single party dominance. The ANC, in so doing so, attracted a broad church of social interests. South Africa's major social struggles thus expressed itself typically as factionalism in the party. Famously, in 1990, South Africa was transitioning out of apartheid. A majority of the social forces which had played a significant role in ending apartheid disbanded and were absorbed into the ANC's party structure. And so South Africa developed pretty much a single party dominant party system. Um, 
but partly due to factional breakaways, which we'll discuss in a moment, it's become increasingly competitive and the ANC is visibly concerned about losing its majority, but there's still no clear alternative to it. So for example, in 2019 national elections, the ANC won 58% of the national vote, the official opposition, the Democratic Alliance, which is a sort of white neoliberal party, won 21% of the national vote, uh, an economic populist party, the Economic Freedom Fighters, 11%, and 11% went to other smaller parties in parliament. And many are saying that in the next election, which is scheduled to take place next year, there is a possibility that the ANC might dip below 50% for the first time. The open question is whether other political parties will be the beneficiaries of this decline. I think that's unlikely, and I think it speaks to the dynamic that I will be addressing today. So in terms of the South African economy itself, the core of the economy of South Africa historically has been in mining and related energy intensive industries and metal production, coal to petroleum chemicals, the so-called minerals energy complex. And this emerged from a concentrated diamond and gold industry with mining houses becoming heavily invested in other mineral extraction, in finance and linkages into manufacturing. And since the 1960s, sanctions and disinvestment trapped the mineral energies conglomerates in the country and expanded opportunities for buying up local businesses. By 1998, for example, the Anglo-American Corporation alone controlled 85% of the companies on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange and 60% of its total value. But after 1994, South Africa entered democracy, these conglomerates unbundled along sectoral lines and globalized, so markets remained highly oligopolistic and collusive. And what this did is it contributed to a relatively capital intensive economy. Since 1994, the ANC's economic leadership has mostly consolidated South Africa's mineral energies complex and it's fast tracked the deindustrialization of the economy. And this has resulted in racial disparities in investment and in education, having produced enduring scarcity of skilled labor. And the country's diversified consumer manufacturing economy, which is now shrinking, which is fostered on import substitution, entered 1994, uncompetitive and decimated by economic liberalization, meaning that the loss of semi-skilled jobs and a decline in union density has resulted in an unemployment figure in the country of 28% in 2019. But that's officially, most analysts estimate that unemployment is close to 40%. Despite this, the state is comparatively redistributive. So state regulatory and allocative decisions are geared towards the promotion of black control and advancement in the economy. And in a moment, we'll discuss why this has been key to the emergence of populist imaginaries and po politics in the country. But it's also included massive programs for free housing, free education, free services, as well as cash transfers, um, which has reduced poverty massively, but it's still not at a pace uh, that is required. And the structure of the economy in South Africa is such that we are considered generally the most unequal country in the world with an income Gini coefficient of around uh, 6.63, uh, a country where 10% of the population owns 90% of the country's wealth and resources. That income and wealth inequality remains highly racialized. So for example, white families in this country have a median household income of 120,000 Rand per annum and black families only have a median household income of 20,000 Rand per annum. Um, so this means that this economic model has been unable to generate sustained high growth job creation as well as equality. And an increasing number of South Africans are dependent on the informal economy of grants and the economy itself is becoming increasingly tenuous as state functions are avoided by corruption, pressures grow for radical distribution. Um, and in the five years up to 2019, the country only had an average annual growth rate of 0.8% per annum, which is below population growth, as well as less than the 2.2% rates of sub-Saharan Africa and the 4.3% of middle income countries. So, what this political context and economic context event eventually sets the field for is the social structure of populism in South Africa, where we see declining union strength, 
a large population of precarious and unemployed, all acting to erode the prospect of class politics. And the erosion of class politics means that linkages between elites and the masses are racialized. Uh, on the one hand, the black political elite controls much of the national state and has used the state as a site for class formation as well as capital accumulation, whereas whites, on the other hand, still play a predominant role in the corporate economy and opportunities in that economy are widely perceived as being ring-fenced and preserved uh, for skilled white labor. The pressures of the democratic transition, the ongoing economic management, mismanagement of state policies, which encourage the voluntary transfer of corporate ownership and managerial control have created patterns of co-optation and accommodation between political and corporate elites across various racial groups. So those who have entered this elite establishment are therefore open to the charge of entering into inauthentic, traitorous, corrupt relationships with racial outgroups, of breaking with the unity and collective interests of their own group. And so racial populism often coheres around a critique of the compromise of the democratic transition as it's expressed in the constitution. So 1994, although extending the franchise to black South Africans is widely perceived as failing to redistribute wealth in the country, which remains in the hands predominantly of white South Africans. And it's widely sort of derided as being a sellout, as being neoliberal, um, as failing to realize the dream of economic emancipation that lay behind demands for the end of apartheid. And so what it does and has functioned to do is it's opened into an attack of all major establishment institutions, including the judiciary, as well as the traditional media. And together with the decline of the traditional media, there is increasing reliance on social media for community news, which is expressed in the widespread circulation of populist tropes and disinformation. And factions which have developed along the lines or the margins of the elite establishment ordinarily are among people vying for a central position in it, use racial populism and the communication infrastructure as a vehicle for mobilizing support. So perhaps the biggest example of this was the July riots in 2021, when former president Jacob Zuma was arrested for being in contempt of court for failing to appear at a hearing investigating statewide corruption and supporters of Zuma used these digital communications infrastructure to basically incite an attack on key national infrastructure and destabilize uh, the country. So a lot of these populist forces have largely emerged as energies within and around the organizational reach of the ANC. They haven't yet managed to displace the ANC. And towards the end, we'll talk about why that was significant. So I've just spoken about Jacob Zuma um, and the Zuma presidency could be read as South Africa's first populist cycle. Uh, quick reminder, he was our president uh, between 2009 and 2019, and he rose to power projecting himself as a man of the people against the often cerebral and distant elitism of his predecessor, Thabo Mbeki, who was known to quote Shakespeare during speeches and was seen as this lofty presence in politics. He organized a coalition of people who had been marginalized by Mbeki, including those purged for disloyalty or corruption, which included communists, union leaders, traditional leaders, as well as the women in youth leagues of the African National Congress, and throughout his presidency, Zuma effectively presided over what is known in South Africa as a policy of state capture, which is the main levers of power and the main institutions of the state being handed over to private interests for enrichment and accumulation, predominantly state-owned enterprises. The, the biggest, one of the biggest ones for which we are reaping the consequences today, myself and Alf, is ESCOM, our national energy utility. It also includes Transnet, which is our national freight train service, um, the South African National Airways, um, and, and many others. So this policy of, of state capture, of patronage and crony capitalism, to use the term that Suhas mentioned earlier, was justified as an initiative of 
so-called radical economic transformation. Um, Zuma himself and his close allies, primarily with the Gupta family, which is a powerful business, immigrant business clan from India, hired a British PR firm called Bell and Pottinger to advance this narrative of radical economic transformation, which was uh, a legitimation exercise to present state capture as an attempt by the government to indigenize South African capitalism. So South African capitalism at that point, widely perceived as white dominated. This was justified as an attempt to actually make the economy black, to actually distribute economic opportunities to black South Africans and primarily through the state. And here's where I see echoes between what Sulhas was talking earlier about welfare being a mechanism to bring people within the control and the power of the regime in South Africa. It was the state and state tenders and opportunities that were used to achieve the same result. However, in 2017, Zuma lost the race for the ANC presidency to Cyril Ramaphosa and Cyril became interim president um, and was formally elected president in 2019 and was widely viewed as a course correction to the last years of Zuma's presidency. He was widely unpopular when he left office and Ramaphosa himself was someone who tried to curry favor with South African business elites and presented his presidency as representing a departure from the patronage years of, of Zuma. But the record since has been that he's largely failed in controlling corruption within his own party um, and has failed to implement effective measures against corruption. Um, his management of the pandemic was marked by widespread austerity as well as widespread corruption. Um, and the result has been that the African National Congress is widely unpopular. However, no alternative appears in sight. But it is precisely in this context of declining ANC hegemony, economic crisis, that a number of new vectors for populism in South Africa are emerging. The first is that populism in South Africa tends to have some call for historic redistribution, but this demand um, has been expanded from just uh, targeting white people and viewing white South Africans as being an obstacle to redistribution, to including recent immigrants from the rest of Africa and South Asia uh, who play a prominent role in, in small retail in the country. And so xenophobia is often expressed in acts of individual or collective violence. It tends to unite racial groups around a broad South African nationalism, concerned with putting South Africa first, reserving jobs for South Africans, securing borders against an influx of migrants. Um, and this is the first vector which is being echoed across the political spectrum in the country. The second is increasing rhetoric around law and order. Given high levels of corruption and crime, law and order rhetoric has widespread appeal with support for the police to shoot to kill and the constitution to be amended to bring back capital punishment. Politicians themselves with the links to organized crime often call for law and order. The fourth vector is around evangelical Christianity, which constitutes a political bloc and a social movement that can mobilize millions of believers in support of political causes. More than 25% of South Africans, including many leading politicians, attend charismatic churches and churches increasingly outwardly align with politicians. And there've been political parties themselves that are formed around um, an evangelical ideology. Um, can talk about some of those later. Um, and the last vector is around traditional leaders. So one thing that's unique about South Africa is that as a relic of apartheid and colonialism, traditional authorities have a lot of political power in this country. Um, and this is something that is in fact a bastardization of customary law as it's interpreted um, by pri primarily rural South Africans themselves. Um, but the upshot of this is that alliances with traditional leaders has been a way for political parties to distribute patronage or mobilize votes. So about a week ago, uh, one traditional leader who is the former leader of, of a Zulu nationalist party called the Nkata Freedom Party, which is based in a province here called KwaZulu-Natal, passed away. 
and notably leaders from across the political spectrum performed a big song and dance going to his homestead, paying their respects in a performance to try and attract voters um, under under the rule of, of traditional leaders. Um, well, um, sorry to interrupt. I can I ask you to wrap in about one minute. Wrap up, yes. Okay, cool. I thought I had two minutes left, but I'll, I'll wrap up quickly now. Okay. And then the final, so those are the vectors of, of populism that are emerging here, but it's primarily a black South African populism. The other strand of populism in, that exists in South Africa is the one advanced by the official opposition, the Democratic Alliance, um, which was historically a white liberal party um, formed by the Anglo-American corporation with strongly liberal roots, which at one point in its history, in the mid 2000s particularly, adopted a strategy of reaching out to the black vote in order to try and change the racial composition of its leadership and membership, but has since abandoned that strategy and has sort of doubled down on trying to appeal to sort of panicked white middle class and rural voters, particularly competing with Afrikaner nationalist and white nationalist parties. Um, the party of sorts to counter smaller parties by articulating a distinctively neoliberal policy populism, where policies for racial advancement are argued to benefit a small, corrupt, and politically connected elite. But I can say more, uh, more of this in the in the question and answer. The point being that in South Africa, populism, rather than being a coherent political force, emerges as a discursive transformation which functions not to displace the African National Congress itself, but to push the ANC further right, to push it to sort of similarly mimic the populist tropes and rhetoric that other um, parties and political forces are, are advancing themselves. And those other parties and political forces themselves might not necessarily be interested in power, but in lobbying the ANC to cut a piece of the state pie for themselves to occupy uh, positions of leadership and decision making, um, but not to displace it. So um, the ANC is unlikely to sort of uh, is unlikely to be displaced as a main political force in South Africa. That said, populism emerges this undercurrent that undergirds politics across the political spectrum. Thanks. Thank you, Will, um, and thank you to all our speakers. I think what we've just seen uh, very clear evidence of is how important it is to interrogate uh, our changing world order and the domestic foundations of that through trans-regional dialogues. Uh, we already have uh, quite a few questions in the Q&A here, and I'm going to read out uh, some of them to get us started on our discussion. Um, I'm going to, and please, uh, to the audience, feel free to pop more questions in there. We will keep track of what you put there, and we will uh, put the questions to uh, to our panelists. Uh, I'm going to start with um, a to, with two specific questions, one to Sohas and one to Kelly, and then come back round with one that, that that brings together, I think, or has the potential to bring together uh, our speakers and their perspectives. Uh, I'm actually going to uh, to 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 raise a question that. Uh, Sanjay Rupalia uh, put to Suhas, which, which Suhas has already been answering in the chat box, but it's an important question. And I, I'd, I'd, I'd like to put it there for, for Suhas to reflect on uh, for all of us. Uh, Sanjay asks, uh, there's Suhas, you provided a masterful overview of the major changes India has witnessed over the last few decades. Can you say more about why religious majoritarianism has become more acceptable over the last decade? Is it because, as critics of secularism argued previously, it never entered popular consciousness? Or did particular factors or changes over the last two decades decades transform the latter? So that's the specific one for Suhas. So I'm going to move on to a second question, which is specifically for Kelly, and that's from Leone. Uh, and the question goes like this. Uh, thank you so much for your remarks. A comment on China, as uh, German media reported earlier this week, the use of Huawei and ZTE in the particular, uh, particularly security critical core network is planned to be banned as early as the 1st of January, 2026. In the Berlin Brandenburg capital region in particular, all Chinese network components are to be removed and replaced by non-Chinese components within the next three years. Can you comment on how impactful a change uh, this would be uh, for, uh, for China? 
a third question, which uh, I'm going to open it to all three of you, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, is Sanjay again, who starts with uh, a question directed to Kelly, but it broadens out. Your analysis of how the party state has arisen or returned in a new way is fascinating. I've not seen, heard such uh, comprehensive detail. It would be interesting to compare and contrast whether and how a new party state formation has developed under the BJP in India. So I think there's an invitation in that question for comparative thinking in terms of where uh, political, you know, in terms of where regimes are moving, uh, both in India and in China. And perhaps also, this comes up in my own work, in their relation to corporate capital. Uh, and this is also something that, that figured quite significantly, I think, Will, uh, in, in your remarks. So I'm going to invite you to, to step in and think about possible parallels, disjunctures, and so on in the South African case as well. So why don't we start with those three? Uh, and uh, we'll start with Shohaz, we'll move to Kelly, and then we'll open the floor to all three of you to reflect on the last question. All right. Uh... I think this is an attractive proposition always to say that secularism failed to enter the popular consciousness. I would slightly reframe uh, the statement and say that in India, uh, at the point of independence, there was always a possibility that majoritarianism would be a major strand of thinking among the larger population. And after the 1950s, uh, the earlier regime failed to weaken that uh, majoritarian consciousness. In a sense, therefore, I would say that it was always incipient there and the economic factors that shaped around 1990s made it possible to really re-emerge in a new format, new and attractive format in the 1990s and more so currently. So uh, it's not a failure of secularism so much, but the failure of the earlier regime to make sure that the goals set out by the constitution uh, really percolated uh, among the populace. So that would be my quick answer to Sanjay's first question. And Alf, do you want me to also touch upon the third question you mentioned or should I wait? Yeah, I'm going to, I'll bring you back in again for the third question, actually. Let's move to Kelly first and then we'll open it to the three of you for the third question. Thanks so much for that insightful response. Thank you. Okay, sure. As for the potential impact of uh, Germany's um, pending ban on Huawei and ZTE products, well, there's an empirical answer to that. And I don't have Huawei and ZTE's market share stats at my fingertips to actually assess the, you know, in, nom in uh, financial terms, what, what that would mean. But certainly if Germany takes, um, Germany's a very significant European player, and it is certainly plausible that um, other countries in the EU would would follow suit. Having said that, uh, and so there there could there could be a you know a, certainly a tangible impact. But Huawei and ZTE and Hikvision and Dahua and all these surveillance companies they have been scrambling to diversify their markets away from the OECD for a couple of years now already. And so in terms of where Huawei stands right now, they actually. Um, their sales growth actually increased by 200% just in the last year, in the first uh, first half of 2023. And that's because um, they just released this Huawei Mate Pro 60 that Chinese consumers are rushing to buy. So it's not just diversification away from OECD markets to the global south, but also China itself has a very significant market. So I these are firms that are profit oriented. They will they will seek markets. I I think they'll they'll survive the the ban by uh, Germany. It's not it's not an empirical question. Mean, you know, it's a, not a very tangible answer. And I will reserve my comments about um, the. Uh, I, I'd actually prefer to hear from Suhas about the BJP party state capitalism comparison. We can we can engage in dialogue on that particular point too. All right. Thank you so much, Kelly. Why don't we do it? like this that will start off with uh, Sohas's response uh, to the question that that started uh, or that, that that sort of gravitates around an, an India China comparison but which also has potential to extend to South Africa and we'll move in the direct in, in sort of uh, in the order of speakers Shahas, Kelly and then and then will if you also want to come in on that so Shahas, why don't you uh, start us off 
you know uh, right now it seems that the model that the bjp has adopted is not to formally uh, change the state structure so much but to control effectively the entire state as well as the social arena uh, to my mind therefore uh, there is a more uh, comparative space comparable space between uh, what the south african experience tells us and what the indian experience tells us in india so far there have been west bengal and gujarat as the two states of india where this party state kind of model has been operational uh, one under the leadership of the left front government and the other under the leadership of the bjp now the left front has practically uh, dismantled itself is no more effective in indian politics anywhere except in uh, the southernmost state of kerala but the composition of the left front there and its character is quite different from what it was in west bengal so the party state relationship then in india generally that is being brought forward is a that the party will not only control the entire state but b the party will also control the social arena and the cultural arena uh that control in a sense forms the basis for the control of the party over the state in the long run but i will i will stop here for the moment kelly over to you yeah sure i think while, while i can understand where the question is coming from there is a fundamental difference in the in the regimes even, even now <laughs> because there there is more than one party um with electoral potential in India, whereas in China, there really isn't. From inception, the People's Republic of China was built as a Leninist party state. During the reform era, there were significant reforms, especially under Deng Xiaoping and, and a bit more under Jiang Zemin, to separate the government from the party, the, like the actual you know gov government institutions from party institutions. And then there was also an effort to separate party involvement from corporate decisions. But that the party has crept back in in various ways and there's no countervailing political alternative to the chinese communist party so while i i, I do understand why why that what motivated that question i don't think it would be uh accurate empirically to really compare it now um i, I really appreciate that suhas mentioned you know west bengal and gujarat because China, uh, India is clearly very decentralized. There's tremendous regional variation. And so one might be able to speak of the emergence of party state capitalism in, in Gujarat. Like I, I, could, I could kind of understand um, that interpretation, but certainly not India wide. Will, go for it. Thanks. Thanks, Alf. Yeah, it's an interesting question. And I mean, even, even making the comparison with India and South Africa, I think. What's perhaps slightly different about South Africa is that the party state formation is largely a political economic one. So it's a matter of the state itself, its institutions and administration becoming an uh, arena and site for ac accumulation and economic opportunities, particularly at the, at the level of, of local government. So... Um, the only way that's politically entrenched is that the African National Congress has this policy of cadre deployment. Um, and in a sentence, what that effectively means is that the ANC decides key economic sectors where it wants its functionaries uh, to be sort of present and, and operative um, and sort of overseeing decisions about which tender contracts are awarded and awarding it to companies uh, that have a favorable view of the ANC, awarding it to companies as an initiative of black economic empowerment towards so trying to build a patriotic bourgeoisie um, and that sort of thing. Uh, but that's starting, that's starting to lose political legitimacy because it's resulted in an incapacitated state, a state that is incapable of sort of delivering basic services to the majority of South Africans. Um, and so the the sort of cultural dimension is 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 absent in the sense that um most South Africans sort of reject the ANC party state, at least 
sort of uh, nominally, um, but there is a dependence on the ANC party state as a source of accumulation and, and economic advancement, particularly because economic opportunities in the rest of the economy are inaccessible to predominantly Black South Africans. So it's, it has its origins in a, in a material kind of uh, material basis, given the structure of the South African economy, but also ideologically, given the ANC's sort of policy since 1994 to try and build a, a Black bourgeoisie. Um, but political legitimacy, it lacks uh, it lacks sort of support in the South African judiciary system. It's very likely that the ANC's policy of, of cater deployment might be ruled unconstitutional. Um, and so there is still that sort of separation of powers where there are checks and balances that can successfully exercise oversight um, over the, the ANC's party state. Thank you, Will. Uh, I'm going to be a bit cheeky and abuse my, my privilege as chair to, to, to add a comment because some of this touches so much on, on, on my own research on the political economy of Hindu nationalism uh, under Modi. And uh, I mean, I, I was wondering if, if, if I'm, what I'm about to propose is something that perhaps goes a bit further than what, uh, what Suhas argued, which is I do think it's in, in very important to, to note that state capital relations under Modi have been characterized, if you well, since 2014, has been characterized both by intensifying corporate consolidation. If you look at, uh, you know, corporate profits in India, something like 70% of it accrues to mainly 20 firms uh, who accumulate at a national scale and also at a transnational scale and who maintain extremely close relations uh, to the BJP government, bankroll their election campaigns and so on and so forth, and have a great deal of say, it seems, in, in the making of economic policy. So the power of capital has arguably never been greater in general in Indian society and their relation to the state has arguably never been greater. And then, you, of course, you have that being coeval with the centralization of political power under Modi, the severing of uh, of sort of, uh, or the undermining of, of, of Indian federalism, if you will. So I do think there is something to be said for thinking through uh, you know, uh, the emerge or, or the, you know, the, 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 sort of the concentration of power, uh, both economic and political happening under Modi. But I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to uh, waste any more of our discussion time on, on my own reflections here. I'm actually going to move to a question that Mark has put, and this goes to, to Kelly, who, who uh, and he asks, uh, Kelly, could you elaborate more on the origins uh, of this profound sense of insecurity felt by the CCP? Is the party and Xi Jinping uh, deploying security threats uh, as a pretext for enhancing power, or is there a genuine sense of insecurity and from which source primarily domestic external did the party view private firms as a genuine challenge despite your earlier research showing private sector being fairly supportive of the ccp and uh, i'm going to give you some time to think about uh, your response to that uh, and go to a uh, to a question from sanjay uh, to uh, to will uh, and this is not a comparative one, uh, so we could perhaps also uh, invite Suhas to comment there as well. Dear William, your analysis weave together many uh, developments. I wonder how state capture and crony capitalism and the growing use of cash transfers in social welfare in India and South Africa compare. So we have again the, the invitation to thinking comparatively uh, about uh, developments in terms of the structuring of political power uh, and, uh, and, and, and the demand for legitimation in relation to, to, uh, to precarious population groups and the kind of welfare policies that are, that are being used to achieve that. A third question uh, to everyone is from Tala, who asks, what are your view uh, on uh, the ever expanding BRICS, uh, i.e. with Iran recently joining? So perhaps we could uh, rephrase that question slightly and say, uh, what role does the expansion of BRICS uh, uh, potentially play uh, in relation to the dynamic? dynamics that uh, you have all three been exploring. Uh, we, of course, in Johannesburg recently had the BRICS summit, uh, and it was quite a spectacle. Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand it back to Kelly to, to take Mark's question. Uh, great. Thank you, Mark, for that question. I think there was, um, 
Uh, one thing that we're we're trying to identify is that even before the contemporary um, escalation of geopolitical tensions and backlash against China, going back by the by the mid two thousands, there were already various issues brewing. So, um, there were the color revolutions in two thousand four externally, the global financial crisis in 08, Arab Spring twenty ten to twenty twelve. Edward Snowden, 2013 to 14. So that, those were external threats, but equally concerning and maybe even more concerning um, for the party's sense of uh, regime durability and vulnerability were the 2008 protests in Tibet, the protests in Xinjiang in 09, um, during under the Hu Wun era from 2010 to 2012, they were reporting increasing social instability due to rising protest strikes and and uh, yeah protest strikes and riots and then uh at, in terms of local finances there was just an explosion of local government debt around 2013 2014 2015 2016 major stock market cr crisis it got so severe that uh, the state bought up nearly two-thirds of all the stocks on the Shanghai Stock Exchange. And that wasn't for profit reasons. It wasn't commercially motivated. It was totally about risk management to maintain social stability. So I, I do, I there are multiple sources of, of insecurity, um, both internal and external. And I think the party has been reflected, uh, very reflective about how to avoid well, first, it was very reflective about how to avoid the fate of the Soviet Union, right? So maybe don't don't simultaneously reform economics and politics at the same time radically <laughs> through shock therapy. Uh, and then then thinking about the lessons from the color revolutions and the Arab Spring and the, also Edward Snowden, they're trying very hard to hold on to, to power. Um, so I do think that insecurity is very real. Uh, the other question was, oh, the role of the private sector over time. You know, I wanted to I want to use that question as an opportunity to respond to Alf's insight about the political economy of Hindu nationalism, because I would agree not being an India specialist at all, but based on what I do know, I, I would agree that um, certainly under Modi um, and Gujarat in particular has seen a privileging of capital, a bit of a neoliberal term though it has also kind of degenerated into cronyistic uses of, as well. Uh, by contrast, I think in China, private capital has become more vulnerable. The, the party state has a very ambivalent stance towards private capital, because on the one hand, it recognizes the contributions to the economy. I mean, it, it, it led the, it, it's leading the tech sector. Um, it has led, it led the real estate boom until it completely messed up. Um, it was a source of pride until it, it got out of control and started buying up assets in a really reckless way. So the party state bo both needs the private sector, but also feels a need to discipline it. And so it does when the private sector goes too far. And these days, the, the, the latest party line is that the private sector is important and we want to encourage innovation and, and all of that. But the private sector is, is a bit gun shy at this point, quite frankly. I mean, they're careful. They know not to be too flashy, get too big, um, speak out in ways that can get them in trouble. I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, and thanks for, for the response to my comment as well. There's lots to think about there, I think. Um, Will, uh, Shohaz, do any one of you want to grab onto that question from Sanjay about uh, the relationship between state capture, crony capitalism, uh, and the uses of cash transfers, the kind of welfare policies that are implemented to, to, to sort of underpin uh, legitimacy? Uh, in, in India and South Africa as deeply unequal societies as well, perhaps. Uh, uh, should we start with your house, perhaps? Okay. You know, uh, I think there are these two parts to the entire issue. One is the actual reality of how uh, capitalism unfolds and how the state interacts with uh, capital. On the other end, the question is whether this relationship is seen as illegitimate by the larger population. 
And the answer is definitely in the negative. At this point of time, I don't see the larger population in India having been more concerned with this state capital relationship. Uh, one of the explanations, of course, could be Modi's personal popularity and other things. But I think also because the focus on welfare has meant that the state is seen as delivering something to a certain section of the society. With all the criticisms of the welfare policies, and one of the criticisms that I mentioned is more theoretical than practical, that welfare is not seen and presented as right, but as patronage. But that is precisely the strength of the regime currently, that because it is seen as patronage and because it is projected as patronage, it is easier for the regime to talk to the citizens more in terms of welfare that they get, more in terms of benefits that they get, than in terms of a theoretical and democratic relationship between both the government and the citizen on the one hand and the government and the uh, private capital on the other hand. So yes, I would say that there is definitely a possibility here that crony capitalism or whatever term we might use for this relationship between state and capitalism uh, would be ignored by a majority of the electorate uh, as an electoral issue or as a political issue for mobilization of protests against the regime. On the other hand, uh, welfare schemes and welfare politics really, the uh, discursive space that welfare occupies uh, happens to be the strength beyond the more critical and also more politically debatable question of cultural and religious nationalism that the regime, in a sense, uh, protects, projects, and also encourages. Over to you, Will. Yeah, I'll, I'll just jump in uh, quickly to to piggyback off what Sohas just said about it matters whether or not the masses see the patronage structures and schemes as illegitimate. And what's interesting about South Africa is that you have, on the one hand, a population that is regularly on the streets protesting against their electoral representatives in primarily service delivery protests. I think for a time we had the highest per capita rate of protests in the world. But on the other hand, you have the tremendous resilience of the political party, which ordinary citizens are protesting against. Um, and I think that phenomenon is partly explained through you know, the Gramscian concept of passive revolution, where, as I said earlier, a lot of contestations in and around the state happened through the African National Congress. So typically social mobilization is not directed necessarily against the ANC in terms of looking for an alternative beyond the ANC, but is primarily putting pressure on the ANC to fulfill the promises that they've made to their constituents, that they've made to the population in the post-apartheid period. And the ANC itself, particularly local government, uses that power to sort of negotiate support from its constituents. So this transactional relationship of if I deliver X amenity or social service, you will vote for me again in the next electoral cycle. And so that dynamic sort of creates this demobilizing tendency where if you sufficiently concede to some of the demands that people are making, you're able to sort of put them at bay for the time being. So the fact that the ANC party state has tremendous power to decide the distribution of resources at this micro-political level, primarily local government, uh, means that a lot of South Africans, I think, rationally sort of come to the realization that the way you access sort of services and key resources and infrastructure is through contestations within the ANC itself. Um, so that has this tremendous demobilizing tendency where it's very difficult for South Africans to, to believe in, in a political alternative because um, they correctly can see uh, where the, the balance of forces are and where the power in the country is, um, which is why it's been very difficult for for other progressive and civil society forces to build alternatives outside of the ANC, precisely because the ANC still directs tremendous power 
in occupying the state over the life and death of millions of people um, and people's material interests dictate that it's far better um, to negotiate for service delivery from uh, a, a partner that you know, rather than take a gamble on, on something else that may backfire. Thank you, Will. Uh, I'm I'm just going to ask Kelly if if uh, if there's anything in, in this discussion that 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 resonates with uh, with the Chinese context, and I'm asking in part because, obviously, uh, just just from knowing that that there are of course concerns with with the project of of political legitimation continually, also for for the CCP and and so on. So I'm just wondering if if, if you want to to tap into what you've heard from from Shahas and Bill here from the Indian and South African uh, context. Yeah, I I wanted to circle back to one of the um, uh, Mark's question about sources of insecurity and when when Xi Jinping first came to power in 2012 rampant corruption was seriously delegitimate delegitimating for the communist party i mean it was he he viewed it as a crisis and launched a major anti-corruption campaign targeting both tigers meaning the really wealthy ones the big ones and flies um but i i think there's probably also consensus in the field that it wasn't um it wasn't targeted consistently. And that to circle back to one of the questions I see in the Q&A by um, Habiba about um, China's control of the private sector, the the tycoons and the private entrepreneurs that have been targeted for various uh, wrongdoings, every, every private entrepreneur in China has to Bend the rules to get things done has to be close to officials not necessarily outright bribery but grease the wheels that's just a reality you don't get to become a really large enterprise without being well connected with various branches of the government and bureaucracies it's just a fact and again it, it's not necessarily through outright bribery but currying favor having good relations um but the the entrepreneurs that have been detained or gone quiet or disappeared or in prison, sentenced to prison for 18 years, they're not, um, I, some of them were singled out for clearly political reasons. For for, in, for instance, Ren Zhichang called Xi Jinping a clown and then he was sentenced to 18 years in prison, right? Like so, some of these, it's not just because of their, their business dealing. So to the extent that there can be, uh, you know, less particularistic, less politicized ways of engaging in redistribution, <laughs> for instance. I mean, that would be the ideal, right? Like actual, honest, transparent government. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not really necessarily hearing that <laughs> anywhere on this panel. <laughs> like, of um, there, there is, I, there, there isn't a party that's necessarily delivering that that has sufficient electoral support. Well, I mean, in China, of course, there's um, these electoral politics aren't as relevant. So that's a not a very uh, clear linear answer, just some reflections. <laughs> Thank you, Kelly. And uh, I believe you tackled uh, the question there from Aviva. So what I'm going to do in the six minutes that we have left is to put to the panel uh, a question from Manjari, uh, and I'm going to ask you to be very brief and crisp and concise in your responses. Um, and I think it's a good good question to end with. Uh, Manjari writes, uh, I wonder if the panelists could go back to the comparative thinking. Here we have three compelling stories of how important countries are experiencing profound shifts in their regimes with more populism, backsliding of institutional autonomy and marginalization of specific minority groups. What have been institutions or movements movements in the three countries that have been important for resisting these moves uh, towards party dominance? What can we learn from each other? Um, we have five minutes left. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, to that we go in the order of speakers again. Uh, Shahas first, I'll pass to Kelly and to Will. Uh, your reflections, please. Wow. Oh. I think one thing I could learn from this panel right now, and also in the long run, I guess, is the resilience of popular protests that uh, Will was talking about. Uh, it seems 
that whatever the regimes do, uh, if there is enough energy and agency in the people, there are still possibilities left to redeem some of the promises that liberal democratic orders originally sort of uh, provided for. Uh, what happens, however, is that increasingly I find that under pressures from either populist imaginations or in the Indian context, the majoritarian imagination, uh, there seems to be a complete delegitimization of the idea of dissent and protest or idea of popular action. Uh, if you look at India, for example, in the last few years, we have witnessed uh, quite a few initial efforts to mobilize the people. And they have consistently been delegitimized. Uh, as a result of which today we find that we are in a position where uh, elections seem to be the only platform through which any political action might take place, if at all. And that's where I think the comparison uh, probably lies. The second lesson we learn from this panel, hopefully, is the tricky issue of state capital relation and the inability of all of us, in a sense, to theorize that and also to find out solutions for uh, more democratic regulation of capital. That's the two things that I would really highlight. Thank you, Shohas. Uh, um, I think I'm, am I next? <laughs> okay. You know, I'm struck more by the contrast between contemporary China under Xi from the other two cases than before Xi. It, under Hu Jintao and Wen Jiabao, there, there was a period where China scholars were proliferating adjectives to modify its form of authoritarianism, populist authoritarianism, consultative authoritarianism, um, consultative, uh, the, responsive authoritarian. I mean, you name it. There were literally like two dozen terms um, that were established to capture how there were different, there was an element of flexibility, responsiveness, and space for uh, influence on implementation of policies, if not policy, the policy agenda itself. But in the last decade or so, we've seen a, a real closure in the possibility of any alt alternative political competition to the Chinese Communist Party. There's been a severe crackdown on civil society, both domestically as well as foreign NGOs. And we've also seen the risks of what happens when private capital is emboldened. So I feel like in some ways the gap is is widening. <laughs> Thanks, Kelly. Will, it's yours. Thanks. I mean, I think what, what Suha said about the resilience of popular protests is, is crucial. And in South Africa, since 1994, we've seen many movements, the treatment action campaign, the anti-privatization movement, the Amadiba crisis committee resisting extractive mining companies, transnational mining companies, Abatali, Basim, John Dolo, and so on and so forth. But I think what this discussion further underscores for me is that you can have sort of oppositional movements uh, against the state and or capital, um, but it becomes crucially important, I think, especially in the conjuncture where we find ourselves facing sort of existential challenges. We haven't even spoken about climate change as a sort of looming sort of threat to humanity. Um, that sort of those popular energies need to become organized to seize the state and to transform the state and to democratize the state. Um, I think that's that's the crucial challenge of 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 the 21st century is is the state emerges as both this oppressive actor um, in many contexts, but also this vehicle through which we the only vehicle we have at our disposal to to address many of the challenges that the world faces, um, and something that I think um, movements across the globe should should treat as 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 something that they should seize and and use for progressive and egalitarian ends. Thank you, Will. Uh, I think that's a very good note to end on. And uh, thanks to all three of our panelists for your insights uh, to the 
attendees for your questions. I, I think we've just had a proper demonstration to repeat myself slightly of of the importance uh, uh, of pursuing dialogues uh, across regions uh, in the global south uh, and across those deep and layered Afro-Asian connections, uh, which uh, which are so important uh, in the context of a changing world order. Uh, so thanks for, uh, for giving up your time. Thanks to the attendees for joining us. Uh, and I think that's a wrap for us. Thanks so much.